Blender is a huge program. You can model, make materials, photorealistic renders or animations, sculpt, run physics simulations, composite, even edit video and sound, and a lot more. There'll be parts of Blender that you may never touch, even if you become an expert in some areas. But all of them depend upon a basic understanding of the workspace. I've made five videos adding up to an hour. If you do the full hour, even as a brand new user, you will be able to make this scene and the animation that you see now. In this first video, you'll learn the navigation and the basic workspace. Next, we'll model the stone lantern. In the third, we'll make the dunes and the rocks, and then we'll create materials, add the image prop woman and the HDRI sky. In the last, I'll show you the basics of animating the camera to make a simple video. But first, let's look at the workspace. The main portion of the screen is taken up with the 3D viewport. Depending on your version, I'm using 3.2, you'll probably have the timeline along the bottom of your screen, and we'll spend some time there in the last video. Along the top of the viewport, you'll find a menu of tools that are relevant to the workspace or the mode that you are in. And there's a lot packed in here, although as you get more comfortable with the keyboard shortcuts, you'll reach up here less frequently. The buttons up in the right corner control the way things in the viewport are displayed, like screen overlays and render modes. Blender icons are cleverly designed. The little globe that looks like a wireframe puts you into wireframe view. The solid circle gives you solid view. The icon that is the same as the material editor icon below gives you material preview, which shows the materials with no lighting or rendering effects. And the shiny sphere is the rendered view that turns on all of the effects and renders the viewport. Also, holding down the Z key with your cursor in the viewport gives you a pie menu that lets you select the render modes as well. Here on the end is the transparent view, which allows you to see through and select the back faces of your mesh. And we'll come back to that and overlays and gizmos in a bit. Across the very top of the Blender window are system menus like file, edit, render, window, and others that may appear depending on the mode that you're in and the add-ons that you've enabled. To the right of those are a series of tabs that are shortcuts to different pre set workspaces. We're in the default layout workspace, but there are workspaces for sculpting, UV editing, painting, shading, and a lot more. And you can add more and make your own depending on how you work. In the upper right corner, you'll find the outliner. Most 3D software has some kind of list version of the objects in your scene. You can select objects in your scene by clicking on them in the outliner. Notice the orange outline around the lantern showing that it is the selected object. You can hide objects in the scene by clicking on the eye icon, just like in most layer style digital tools. Clicking on the camera icon will hide the object from the render camera. You can rename objects by clicking on the generic name or hitting the F2 key and that's a good habit to get into. Below the outliner is the properties editor. There is a lot packed into this little palette. Notice the ribbon of icons along the left edge. Each of these opens up a different submenu, and it's a good idea to hover over the icons and learn their names. One of the issues with a tool as powerful as Blender is that it's easy to forget where the settings are. You'll notice that a lot of these have little tick menus, and sometimes you've done almost everything right, but you're still not getting the desired effect. And it may just be that there's a little checkbox somewhere that you haven't found. It's a good thing about Blender that there are millions of people using it, and searching online for an answer is usually pretty easy. For example, if you forget how to render your scene with a transparent background, you can just search online or on YouTube and discover that you need to open the Render tab, find the Film drop down and check the transparent button, of course. Well, don't worry about learning all this at once, but at the same time, don't hesitate to start poking around in these menus as a lot of the power of Blender can be found over here. Notice that the color of the tab icons can help you out as well. White icons are scene-wide adjustments like the render engine and the global settings. Red icons deal with materials like the world tab that we'll explore when we add our ocean background. And then down below are material and texture tabs. Blue tabs open up modifiers, physics, particle systems, and constraints, basically things that do stuff to objects. And green icons are context sensitive and only appear when you select certain objects like the camera and the light that have special menus only relevant to those kind of objects. But let's move back into the main workspace and look at some of the small but helpful things here. This weird compass thing is a navigation gizmo. It can help you remember that the red axis is the X axis, side to side, green is Y, depth, front and back, and Z is blue, up and down. Blender, like many 3D tools, is Z up. Some software like Maya is Y up, but don't worry about that for now. 
If you left click and drag on the gizmo, you can orbit around your scene, but you really only need to do this if you don't have a middle mouse button, as holding the middle mouse button down and dragging does the same thing anywhere in the viewport. Clicking on any of the circles will jump to an orthographic view, like front, side, and top. If you have a full-size keyboard with a number pad, it's a lot faster to use the 1, 3, 7, and 9 keys, the corner numbers. 1 is front, 3 is side, 7 is top, and 9 flips you around to the opposite side of the current view. So if you're looking at the front of your model and you want to quickly see the back, just hit the 9 key and then 9 or 1 again to flip back to the front. This even works in perspective view. To get back into perspective view, you just middle mouse and drag, or drag the gizmo if you don't have a middle mouse. And by the way, it's really going to save you a lot of time and hassle if you are using a three-button mouse and a full keyboard when working in Blender. There are a lot of workarounds, but Blender is a lot easier with a real mouse and number pad. The four white icons below the navigation gizmo are there to help you if you don't have a three-button mouse and a full keyboard. To zoom with a mouse, just simply point your cursor at what you want to zoom into and use your scroll wheel. If you don't have one, you can left-click and drag over the magnifying glass icon. The hand dollies the view around. Shift middle mouse does the same. However, you may notice in my screencast keys that it says spacebar when I dolly. That's because every other tool that I regularly use has spacebar doing that. So to keep myself sane, I've changed the keyboard shortcut for myself to spacebar. But you're going to want to use shift middle mouse. The camera icon jumps into the camera view. The zero key on the full size number pad does the same. The grid icon, or 5 on the number pad, moves you in and out of orthographic and perspective view. The tilde, or the grave key, that's the one right above the tab and below escape, that opens up a navigation pie menu that's good to know about too. The view menu can also give you all of these commands, but it's by far the least efficient way to do that. You really should only go up there if you forget the keyboard shortcuts. There is a hidden panel off to the side here that is opened and closed with the N key. You can also click on this teeny tiny arrow up here. Opening the side panel reveals another row of tabs. I have a lot more than you probably do at the moment because many of these only appear when you have enabled add-ons, so don't worry if you have a lot less than me. We won't need to worry too much about these tabs at the moment, so feel free to hit the N key again and hide this side panel. Also, T hides and shows the tools along the left side of the screen, and these tools change depending on the mode or the workspace that you're in. Up at the center of the viewport are some important snapping and selection settings. We won't worry too much about that for now, but know that you can turn on snapping by clicking on the magnet icon. This drop down adjusts the type of snapping that you want. Next to that is proportional editing, and we'll talk about that in another video. And on the other side, you can control the pivot points and how the transform tools work. And there's one other hidden window in the workspace that can be really frustrating for beginners. Almost everything that you can add to your scene can be parametrically edited right after you add it. I'm going to just hit Shift A to add an object to the scene. I'll add a cylinder. And notice that this adjustment window appears way down here in the lower left. And to make it even harder, it might even be tick close and almost unnoticeable. But before you do anything else except for move the view around, you can adjust the mesh. I can make it a three-sided prism, or I can increase the edges to make it a very rounded cylinder. I can adjust the radius, the height, whether it has caps and its position, all from this menu. If you click in the scene, it will disappear. But if you haven't done anything else yet, other than change your view, you can hit the F9 key and bring it back. But as soon as you add any other objects or make any other kind of changes, that adjustment window will be lost and you'll have to go into edit mode to make changes on your object. There are a few more things to learn about the workspace, but we'll get to those at the start of the next video where we will get to work on the lantern.